uh, this round table has as its, has as its subject human and non-human soundscapes. Uh, the um, microphones are, are being run today by two of, uh, two of our students, again. They are Thomas Murphy and uh, Emily Obrock. <coughs> um, I'm going to follow the model that was set by Evan Spritzer yesterday, which I thought was really successful, uh, it, with, with just one minor adjustment, uh, which is that I'm going to introduce all of the speakers together uh, in, one, in, one, in one go at the beginning, and then ask them to speak uh, one after the other in the order that they are in the program. Uh, but apart from that, the, form the format will be identical. Everyone will speak, I hope, for 15 minutes. Then there will be a, a, sh a short <coughs> period for discussion between the panelists and, uh, uh, and then general conversation uh, with, the, with, with the spectators and audience. Uh, those of us who are trying to uh, look at the PowerPoints uh, can, I think, have the choice between leaving the podium and sitting in the front row after they've spoken or uh, craning their necks. <laughs> uh, in Philip's case, I think sitting in the front row might be better because yeah. your neck will have to go around 180 around. degrees. <coughs> so it's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome our four speakers this morning. Uh, uh, in order, they are uh, Eliza Zingesser, Philip Usher, Eugène Licole, and uh, Rachel Mundy. Uh, Eliza Zingesser is a specialist of medieval French and Occitan literature and an assistant professor of French at Columbia University. She's currently completing a book manuscript entitled Stolen Song, How the Troubadours Became French, which documents the act of cultural appropriation that became a founding moment for French literary history the rescripting and domestication of Troubadour Song, a prestige corpus in the European sphere as French, and the simultaneous creation of an alternative point of origin for French literary history, a body of faux archaic Occitanizing song. Her next project is on song and bird song, I believe. And the title of her contribution is Bird Talk in Medieval France and Occitania. Uh, Philip Usher is a colleague of mine in the Department of French Literature, Thought and Culture, here at NYU. He's also affiliated with the Department of Comparative Literature. A prolific scholar, he's worked extensively in the field of early modern cosmography and space, and from there has come increasingly to explore ecological criticism and what he describes on his website as an intellectual sandbox that I call the humanist anthrop anthropocene. He has no fewer than three forthcoming books that reflect these intersections, <coughs> all expected in 2018, La Aide et le Géographe, Poésie et Espace du Monde à l'époque pré-moderne, on, on the Exterranean, Ecologies of Extraction in the Humanist Anthropocene, and co-edited with Pauline Gould, Early Modern Ecologies. And his contribution is going to be on plant talk. Uh, thirdly, Eugène Nicole, another colleague of mine in French literature, thought and culture, is a man of many qualities, editor of Proust for La Pléiade and the author of numerous articles on A, a La Recherche, connoisseur of French poetry, a poet himself, and editor of the important journal Poétique. Eugène is well known outside academia for his novels, most of which center on his birthplace, Saint-Pierre-et-Miquelon, an, over an overseas French territory, or plutôt collectivité, of islands just off the coast of Newfoundland, and the most recent of these novels, Retour d'Ulysse à Saint-Pierre, appeared earlier this year. He was decorated for his distinction in French letters by being made Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. And his title today is Hugo's Légion and the Concept of Sound Space. And then thirdly, uh, Rachel Mundy is an assistant professor of music in the Arts, Culture and Media program at Rutgers University in Newark. She specializes in 20th century sonic culture with interests at the juncture of music, the history of science, and animal studies. Her forthcoming book, Animal Musicalities, traces comparisons between human and animal songs from social Darwinism through the post-war rejection of racial science. She's currently working on a comic book-inspired biography of American song collector Laura Bolton, 
that features archival photographs of Laura's trip to Angola for the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in 1930 to 1931, and on a second monograph titled Hearing Beyond Humanism that traces a generation of women biologists who turned in the 1970s to musical listening in lieu of laboratories as a way of reconfiguring notions of animal intelligence. And her title is Words in the Air, I love this title, Words in the Air, Voices in the Trees. <laughs> okay, so great welcome to everybody. Um, and we'll start, Eliza, with you. If you want to use the mic on the podium or if you're going to speak from here. This is, um, well, I think I'll speak from here if that's, what do you prefer? Um, if you can coordinate with the, with, the, with, with the slides, that's fine. Right, well, the problem is that I have to, do, I do have to click on a link to a YouTube video at one point, but even over there, I could not figure out how to use the mouse. Could someone, okay, fabulous. So I'll just signal if that's okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. My comments today elaborate on a paper I published last year in which I argued that medieval song was a privileged vehicle in which to feel out the boundary between human and avian vocalization. I suggested more specifically that lyricists perceived the similarity between certain avian vocalizations and human song as practiced in medieval Europe. Fundamentally, at least as concerns medieval strophic song, both types of vocalization are structured simile. Similarly, both involve the repetition of acoustic material at regular intervals, most obviously in the melody as presented in the strophe. In birdsong, the repeated elements are often called syllables. But in the case of human vocal production, even in the absence of melodic material, and many medieval songs are indeed transmitted without their melodies, the kinship remains since the rhyme schemes that structure medieval lyric involve a comparable repetition of acoustic material. In this case, the regular appearance of certain rhyme sounds in particular succession. The same criterion of regular acoustic recursion could be applied to refrains, assonance, and alliteration, all common features of medieval poetry in which acoustic material recurs at short intervals. Medieval poets explored this kinship between human and avian song in a corpus, unsurprisingly, about birds. Some medieval writers explored the similarity not with respect to acoustic recursion, but with respect to opacity. The troubadour Paire Cardinal, for instance, claimed that his song was as difficult to decipher as the nightingales. And I quote, I sing and play the flute for myself, for no man except me understands my language. As little as they understand the nightingale, do people understand what my song says. <laughs> Other medieval writers framed birdsong not just as opaque, but as incomprehensible. Chaucer's Parliament of Fowls elsewhere renders avian speech in perfect Middle English, but famously devolves in one line to the nonsensical utterance, keck, keck, cuckoo, quack, quack. This association between avian language and, the indecipher and indecipherable utterances persists to this day, in fact. While it may be more common to compare something we don't understand to Greek, to call something gobbledygook is, etymologically, to call it turkey talk. In the same vein, according to the OED, the verb chatter was initially used to denote all bird vocalizations, with the acceptation of the term gradually shrinking to birds whose, I quote, Sounds approach those of the human voice, e.g. starlings and magpies. When applied to human beings, says the OED, the verb means to talk rapidly, incessantly, and with more sound than sense. Medieval framings of birdsong as opaque, indecipherable, or nonsensical have been discussed in scholarship, and it is on another framing that I would look, like to focus today. I would suggest that some writers, rather than emphasizing the inscrutability of birdsong, instead engaged in formal experiments that foregrounded various forms of sonic recursiveness in otherwise comprehensible discourse. In so doing, they make it impossible to draw a firm line of demarcation between human and avian vocalization. I've suggested that we describe this type of poetics as zoopoetics, that is, in the words of Aaron Moe, the process of discovering innovative breakthroughs in form through an attentiveness to another species' bodily poesis. 
Before turning to the subspecies of zoopoetics that I've called, in a terrible pun, pigeon, P-I-D-G-I-N, poetics, <laughs> I want to provide some evidence that medieval thinkers were deeply attentive to the structure of birdsong, since such attentiveness is a prerequisite to the elaborate formal imitation that I've posited in a particular corpus of medieval lyric. <coughs> there is abundant evidence of a keen interest in birdsong in the French and Occitan Middle Ages. First of all, there is evidence of experiments similar to ones today on the limits of avian intelligence as measured by an ability to learn non-native song. The 13th century theologian Thomas of Cantonpré reports in his Liber de Natura Rerum that a blackbird was able to learn notes according to human art. Elsewhere in the same work, he mentions a lark that was captured in youth and caged and taught to sing something other than its own song. An Evreur de Conti, writing in the 14th century, recounts an anecdote about a starling who was able to learn a particular virlet. The virlet is a complex form, and to suggest that a starling is capable of reproducing it says much about medieval knowledge of the starling's remarkable capacity for imitation. The starling is, in fact, at the center of the example of zero poetics I'd like to focus on today. The troubadour Marco Brew has a famous pair of songs about one such bird who serves as an intermediary between a lady who is court courting multiple suitors and her doting lover. I don't have time to go into great depth here, but I want to give a brief example of Marco Brew's imitation of starling vocalization. This is the rhyme scheme of Marco Brew's pair of songs. <coughs> and I apologize that I did my best with this PowerPoint, but it was difficult to fit it all in. Um, Throughout each of the Starling poems, the sounds of the A and B rhymes are constant, Ada and Ia in the first song, and Ida and Ensa in the second, while the C rhyme changes in each, each stanza. This poetic structure is one in which the C rhyme is given exceptional prominence in its materiality as a signifier, given both that it is the only rhyme sound that changes in each song, and that it is encapsulated in three syllable lines a fact that makes the appearance of the rhyme sound almost constant in the fifth through tenth line of each stanza. In the first poem, the speaker invites the starling to take flight and visit his mistress, while the second recounts the starling's visit to the woman. In the second poem, the starling and the beloved actually converse, and the starling's direct speech is reported. And if I've done it correctly, these are the passages in bold on the slide. Marker Brew's imitation of the starling's vocalization patterns are most extreme, unsurprisingly, in the direct speech of the starling. The starling speaks directly in only three stanzas, three, seven, and eight. In stanza three, it introduces the rhyme sound eek, and in seven and eight, its C rhymes are uts and e. I believe the two sounds in E in stanzas three and eight are intended to call to mind the type of repeated screeching in Starling song that might best be transcribed with the sound E. And I have to say very curiously, as I was beginning to work on this material, I developed an infestation of Starlings in my vent. So I'm deeply familiar with <laughs> the Starling's <laughs> vocalization patterns. Um, could someone click on the... I just need the first few seconds of it. That's great. <laughs> In sum, Marco Bruce Starling makes us hear the succession of E E E as noise. Noise encapsulated in semantic language significantly, but also as non referential noise. What is more, the C rhymes of stanzas seven and eight, uts and e, evoke another distinctive feature of starling vocalization, mimicry. <coughs> the rhyme sound uts follows the pattern established elsewhere in the song in the sense that it is, strictly speaking, unique. I would note, however, that the rhyme sound uts is an amalgamation of almost all of the rhyme sounds specific to the woman's direct speech elsewhere in the song. Like a real starling, Marco Bruce Bird riffs on the sounds produced around it. The only one of the Starling's rhyme sounds that does not fit into the pattern of amalgamation is its last rhyme sound, E. And in fact, rather than amalgamating the sounds of the lady's speech, here the Starling instead imitates her rhyme sounds directly. 
Um, go and t in English, go and tell him to approach in the morning for beneath a pine, we shall put an end to this ill will with me beneath him. I could elaborate more on Marco Bruce Starling, but I want instead to take a step back to think about the ramifications of this type of zero poetics. I would argue that Marco Bruce's experimentation alongside similar experiments by other poets present a kind of resistance to the standard categories of voice as transmitted in late antique and medieval grammatical treatises. As Elizabeth Leach and others have explored at length, voice was most often classified according to criteria of transcribability in writing on the one hand and of meaningfulness or meaninglessness on the other. Birdsong was most often classified as writable but meaningless within this grid. Markebrew and other poets who engage in similar experiments seem to agree that birdsong is transcribable, but they also attribute meaning to birdsong. It is ostensibly a feature within what superficially appears to be transparent referential discourse. This inseparability of human and avian vocalization raises the possibility, first of all, that all language is potentially interspecial, and second, that meaningfulness is not an objective quality that can be safely ascribed to an utterance, but rather something dependent instead on the ear of the listener. Marco Bruce's Starling song is apparent only to those who know how to listen for it. At least as transposed by Marco Bru, the Starling speech is no longer meaningless. Its utterances are inextricable from referential discourse. However, seen in, in another way, one could argue that Marco Bru's song is rendered incomprehensible by the presence of the Starling song, song ensconced within it. When one attends to the features of the Starling song, hearing its call in Marco Bru's verse, one begins to lose sense of the referential content of the poem. That is, one begins to hear its sound patterning over its sense. That the comprehensibility of biophony is a function less of an objective feature of the sonic object in question and instead of the listener's abilities is also suggested by the theorist Marquetta of Padua who suggests not that the crow's cry, cra cra, is meaningless, um, but rather that we don't know what crows mean when they produce this utterance. I quote, there is a type of voice that is meaningless and writable, which cannot be understood, and yet can be written, such as voices of birds calling craw craw, the effect of whose vocalization we do not know, though it can be written. Though Marchetto does use the term meaningless, he qualifies this by suggesting that the vocalization is meaningless to us. The same theory of avian vocalization, curiously, lies behind the name given to the social networking site, Twitter, if you had assumed that a tweet was so named because of its constrained brevity, and this is what I had always assumed, you would be wrong. Here's what the founders have to say, quote, the whole bird thing. Bird chirps sound meaningless to us, but meaning is applied by other birds. The same is true of Twitter. A lot of messages can be seen as completely useless and meaningless, but it's entirely dependent on the recipient. <laughs> Not if you're Donald Trump. <coughs> Um, conversely, some medieval theorists claim that a non-human animal, animal utterance that sounds exactly like human language is still meaningless because it is not produced with the intention of communication. One of these same theorists, however, also acknowledges that the intention behind a linguistic act is not necessarily to transmit a message via a referential utterance. One can instead, this theorist claims, take pleasure in the act of vocal repetition for its own sake. Such pleasure is, of course, one of the many pleasures of poetry. In sum, I have suggested today that, that medieval poets were attuned to the fact that all rhymed poetry is fundamentally nothing more than a recursive sonic structure and one in which sound and sense are in constant tension. In encapsulating avian vocal patterns within referential language transmitted in verse, medieval poets postulate a new theory of utterance. Meaningfulness or meaninglessness, they suggest, are not objective qualities that can be safely measured. Instead, much depends on the attentiveness of the listener. They further suggest that all language, including referential human language, can lose its apparent meaningfulness when one attends to its sound patterning. This loss of meaning has been baptized by contemporary theorists as semantic sati satiation a phenomenon through which repetition causes a word to lose meaning for the listener who instead perceives the speech as meaningless sound. 
Contemporary theorists have also concluded that the mode of listening elicited by zoopoetics, a mode of listening that attends to sound and sense simultaneously, is precisely the mode necessary for all poetry. Ruben Sur, for instance, in his book, What Makes Sound Patterns Expressive, argues for a poetic mode of listening in which acoustic signals are perceptible even through referential language. In medieval zoopoetics, species boundaries dissolve, at least if language is the yardstick, yardstick through which they are defined, and the common distinction between meaningful and meaningless language fails to hold water. An engagement with birdsong leads poets not to use an imagined linguistic boundary to shore up species difference, but instead to foreground the noise at the heart of all language, and most especially poetry. The pigeon poetics, or contact language of this corpus, is neither human nor avian, neither meaningful <coughs> nor meaningless, but always all of these things simultaneously. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you to, uh, to Sarah and to Francois for putting on just such an amazing uh, few days. Like, it's just such a rich, a rich banquet that we're all enjoying. So I just wanted to start by saying thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. And uh, it's just absolutely fabulous. So, so thank you. <laughs> so. I'm just standing here so I can see my images. So, so to begin, um, an epigraph from Michel Serre uh, to be followed by two short sound clips. So first, the epigraph. J'ai désir de penser que ce bruit que j'entends est produit par un être que j'aimerais connaître, which we can translate perhaps as follows, lingering over the entendre from Latin intendere. I wish to think that this noise that I hear, to which I lend my attention, to which I stretch myself, is produced by a being whom or that I would like to know. So next, uh, two sound clips. Uh, can you? So what do we hear? Towards what being do we lend our ear and our being? Firstly, to rain falling on a variety of leaves of radically different sizes, which become an orchestra of vegetal drum skins, the collocation vegetal skins already disturbing many categories. Secondly, to a drying ponderosa twig, whose ultrasonic pops were captured over a 12 hour period via a sensor as biodata and turned into audible clicks those 12 hours being condensed into just 40 seconds. These two recordings were made, uh, quite different ones, were made by David George Haskell in preparation for the writing of a book you've, you've probably heard of, The Songs of Trees, and serve alongside Michel Serre's epigraph to open up the question of what we might mean when we talk about plant sound. Do plants make sound? Do plants hear sound? If we have to listen with an instrument, what kind of operation is that? 
Is a microphone different from a stethoscope, different from an ultrasonic sensor, different from an electrode connected to a Raspberry Pi? To put it in terms that Sarah brought up yesterday, should we connect sound to the rational soul of humans, to the sensitive soul of beasts, or, and here I obviously uh, go a little bit into the unknown, to the vegetative soul of plant life? I clearly lean towards the latter position, echoing in that Emmanuel Cotia's point in La Vie des Plantes that in our pneumatological existences, we share un même souffle, the same pneuma, the same breath. <coughs> Unless we think that that is just sleight of hand on Cotia's part, he reminds us that, quote, each day we breathe in and feed upon the gassy excretions from the vegetal world, i.e. oxygen. As this is a round table, not a panel of papers per se, I'm going to limit myself to just five five uh, brief remarks. So remark one, plants are deaf, but they intend don't. Such seems to be the conclusion reached by scientists, according to Daniel Chamovitz, in what, uh, what a Plant Knows. The hair cells in our ears are sensitive to volume and pitch. Plants seem to be capable of neither. Ever since Darwin tried measuring plants' responses to his own bassoon playing, hundreds of other scientists and pseudoscientists have attempted to see what plants make of sound. Dorothy Retelek played Schoenberg, Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, and others to her plants, claiming that they, grew more, that they grew more healthily when listening to classical music. But no one has ever been able to reproduce this in a laboratory. <coughs> Richard Klein and Pamela Edsel uh, of, New of the New York Botanical Garden exposed marigolds to Gregorian chant, Mozart, Symphony 41 in C major, the Beatles, and many other kinds of music, concluding that, quote, on the other hand, music did not influence the growth of the marigolds. In their now infamous Secret Life of Plants, Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird made the claim that their plants responded positively to Bach and Mozart, but especially to the music, the sitar music of Ravi Shankar. Now, uh, again, those claims have not been able to be uh, reproduced in a laboratory. The theoretical question that arises here, of course, is what is hearing? What is entendre? What is intendere? When bees stimulate a, a flower to release its pollen by rapidly vibrating their wing muscles, the flower is shaken and indeed reacts human ears also react by hearing a buzzing. What we can say is that both, in any case, intendunt, i.e. lend themselves towards something, which we might as well call sound for now. Remark two, plants should be seen but not heard. Such is the lesson quickly learned from the history of Western botany. The visual bias of Western culture in general, and of Western science in particular, a bias much discussed in sound studies, and as Sarah said yesterday, sometimes in, in somewhat um, puritanical terms, uh, the primary classical texts about plants, uh, those, i.e., of uh, Pseudo-Aristotle, Theophrastus, Dioscorides, and Pliny, uh, are pervaded by this, uh, by this bias. In all of these authors, plants are identified primarily in terms of visible physical characteristics, such as height, shape, or color, as if plants do not exist in air and amidst the sound waves that they both produce and necessarily respond to. Other senses are sometimes mentioned for sure. Theophrastus, for one, discusses not just visual differences, but also the taste differences. The singular mention of plant sound in Theophrastus, or at least as far as I can tell, is somewhat incidental, describing how the sweet chestnut, which grows tall and is used for roofing, is said when it is about to fall to make a noise so that men are forewarned. And he gives the example of uh, what happened at the baths at Antandros when everybody suddenly ran out of the baths. Otherwise, in classical botany, plants are mostly silent. The visual bias in botanical description of plants, and whether or not we should say visual bias, we can maybe come back to, uh, uh, as the, 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 the good discussion after the first panel yesterday suggests we, we should. Um, so to give just one example um, of how this continues into the early modern period, uh, let's look very briefly at this book. Um, the most famous of early modern printed herbals, namely the De Historia Sterpium, or History of Plants, of Leonard Fuchs, published in 1542, and which contains almost 900 folio pages. Every aspect of the book points to this emphasis on the visual. In this hand-colored copy, which is now at the uh, U.S. National Agricultural Library in D.C., uh, which is fabulous, and you should go there because no one ever goes there, um, uh, it's just like this, uh, you know, 15-story building just outside of the city, uh, and uh, there's very few people there, uh, but they have great early modern stuff. Anyway, so we see in the uh, the picture here. Uh, the author holding a plant, he's touching it, he can probably smell it, uh, he has seen or will see it, and he might taste it. And at the very end of the volume, um, uh, we come across this double portrait of the two artists who are responsible for the more than 500 plant pictures in the book, Heinrich Fulmara and Albrecht Meyer. Uh, 
Zooming in, we see how the visual reproduction of the plant's form is figured as the Historia Sterpium's major achievement. This book, both in Latin and various translations, as well as many other books which were either based on it uh, or, or, or you know, sort of very close translations of it, uh, circulated around early modern Europe, showing what plants looked like. Here we see, for example, a rose and a spinach plant. Now, there's, uh, there's some, some great recent scholarship on, on, on this, uh, this book, uh, most notably uh, Sashiko Kusukawa's uh, tellingly titled Picturing the Book of Nature from 2012. And interestingly, she makes it clear that Fuchs's emphasis on the visual was not actually uh, universally accepted by botanists at the time, uh, detailing uh, <coughs> notably how fellow humanist Janusz Kornarius questioned whether Fuchs's images could really serve to communicate knowledge about plants but nowhere is sound ever advocated as a possible alternative or additive to sight. And if we, were, if, 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 if we, uh, if, if we had more time and we, we were to look at French herbals of the same time, so Jacques Deléchamps and Carolus Clusius and others, uh, we get to pretty much the same conclusions. Remark three, on the joy of plants. I'd like to skip forward then just slightly to the 17th century and to the figure of Guy de la Brosse, most famous for being the founder of the Jardin des Plantes in Paris, created by Edict in 1626 and opened to the public in 1634. There will be much to say about Guy de la Brosse, for he was quite the rebel. He not only challenged the authority of the Faculté de Médecine, he was no more widely as a vocal vegetarian and a defender of the uh, bisexual atheist and exile poet Théophile de Vieux. Most importantly for us today, he's the author of this book. De la Nature, Vertu et Utilité des Plantes, published in 1628. Uh, like most early modern botanical books, it's very long, uh, 900 pages, and I'm only going to scratch the surface here. On the one hand, uh, uh, La Brosse enumerates his authorities, right, looking at the, 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 um, the frontispiece. Uh, uh, so going around uh, from top left uh, and going clockwise, we have Hippocrates, Dioscorides, Theophrastus, and Paracelsus. Paracelsus. Uh, on the other hand, uh, all of uh, these authorities are depicted under the sub-solar uh, banner, which reads, la vérité et non l'autorité, right? And so throughout, La Brosse is actually going to be much more uh, privileging first-hand observation, uh, autopsy, and experience rather than inherited authorities, despite the fact that they're uh, on the front. That's sort of a backhanded compliment to them. So the reason I speak of La Brosse today is that differently from most of his predecessors, and as one of a number of what Dominique Branchet has called 17th century practitioners of la botanique sensible, he allows, albeit non-systematically, for plant sound. La Brosse opens his book with the following sentence. I'll just read the English. The innumerable and diverse beauties that we see in plants can reasonably persuade us via their mute mouths, leur muette bouche, that these first daughters of the earth are not produced by wise nature as vain ornaments for the countryside. They surpass in number and goodness the stars in the firmament. They clearly serve some other purpose. For this fine language written life likely, au vif in so many colors, flavors, smells, and shapes is no less heard, entendu, than that of the most eloquent mouths. La Brosse talks then of the mute mouths of plants, but then goes on to express in what Cyrus Modi calls the synesthetic conversion uh, of how, uh, sorry, to express how plant beauty can be heard as if from eloquent mouths. We're of course only in the domain of analogy at this point. But this first mention of mute mouths nonetheless uh, prepares the reader for a moment much later in the book. In chapter nine, titled Si les plantes se meuvent à la joie et à la tristesse, on where the plants are moved by joy and sadness, that La Brosse discusses various senses and how they obtain or not in both plants and animals. Thus, La Brosse asserts that plants do possess a sense of taste, and further, that their sense of taste is just as real or as full as that of animals, human or otherwise. It is not just that plants eat for La Brosse, but that they enjoy the tasting when they eat. Pache Aristotle, plants have uh, here souls not only vegetative, but also sensitive. Similarly, plants possess in La Brosse the sense of touch and indeed of sound. Still in this chapter on joy and sadness, La Brosse explains as follows. And I'll just give one example. In summer, after suffering long and dry heat, trees can be seen to move as the rain finally <laughs> arrives. And they can be heard through the movement of their branches and their leaves, uttering an agreeable murmur of joy, an agréable murmure de joie. The sound of Theophrastus' falling tree did not grant the tree any more of a being than would the sound of a falling boulder uh, to a stone. 
The sound of La Brosse's trees experiencing rain after hot summer days, their murmure de joie, is quite different, allowing the sound we hear to tell us that we are indeed hearing a being that's aware of, of this. Aware, what? We can come back to that word. J'ai désir de penser donc que ce bruit que j'entends est produit par un être que j'aimerais connaître. Remark four, instruments. Although there are some classical and pre-modern examples of medical auscultation uh, of the body, it was not until the 19th century uh, that René Théophile Hyacinthe Lanec's invention of the stethoscope brought such attention into the, uh, to sound into the field of medicine. Until that point, the body was uh, like trees, and with, of course, many caveats and footnotes, uh, uh, rather more silent than today. Over the last decade or two, something equivalent has happened for plant sound, namely the use of multiple new instruments, including indeed the stethoscope, to access, to sonify, to translate for human ears the sounds of plants. There is, for example, the MIDI sprout, a biodata sonification system created by Philadelphia-based arts collective Data Garden. The device measures the current that flows between two probes placed on a plant and converts the millisecond by millisecond fluctuations into MIDI data that can be led into a synthesizer or a computer. And there are many uh, other sort of homemade versions of this. Um, basically just means measuring a current and then, and then you know, doing something with it. Um, so let's listen to one example. Could you? Um Um, so everything we heard was generated, right, by the orchid. Um, we, can, we can come back to the example. It's just as natural or cultural or natural cultural as me holding a flute, right? At least I, I claim so. A number of sound artists have used uh, combinations of multiple instruments, such as that one, uh, to produce complicated orchestras of sound, such as the LA-based artist Mylise, M-I-L-E-E-C-E, -E -E, who was featured at MoMA in 2013. And if you, if you should look, if you don't know her work, look it up, it's absolutely spellbinding. Just as a stethoscope and medical instruments were, uh, raise philosophical questions about where and when we intendimus human life, so recent experiments in plant sound must force their way into philosophy. In her Through Vegetal Being, Lucy Higaray wrote recently, as if echoing Serre, as for listening, what can listening signify if it does not imply a relation to and with a living being here and now present to and with me? And it might be interesting to come back to that in the light of the idea of, of the acousmatic turn because uh, uh, it, 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 it raises some interesting questions at that, at that juncture, I think. So to conclude, what preceded was obviously not a full history of plant sound, nor indeed of plant silence, but a few moments of both as an invitation to question what it means to entendre and to intendere the non-human when the non-human is also non-animal. If sound, as Serre and Irigaray would have it, brings us into a state of being with, then must, this must force us to reckon with plants. Yet, in many ways, we're still having to fight against Aristotle's idea of the vegetative soul. Hearing my heart through a stethoscope delivers me to my being. The midi sprout and similar devices surely do something similar for plant being. The stakes, I think, are high, and they turn, as Francois said yesterday, on the question of how sound studies can interrogate and nudge forward uh, certain questions in philosophy and theory. Jeffrey Nealon, in his plant theory, recently spoke of what he calls animal studies' foundational abjection of plant life. <laughs> Katia, in la, I, I, I was waiting for that. Uh, Katia, in La Vie des Plantes, similarly diagnoses the problem of metaphysical snobism that is synonymous for him with animal chauvinism, meaning that philosophy is all too often physiocidal. I love that term. Nealon, uh, for his part, pushes back at this foundational abjection via close readings of some of the texts central to animal studies, especially Derrida's L'animal que donc je suis. If Derrida's text is about recognizing the animal in the human, there is, as Nilon shows, no place for plants. Says Nilon, quote, 
In the end, Derrida's work on life and the Heideggerian world has the ongoing effect of continuing co to contain the question of life within supposedly singular organisms and their worlds. Whether, with Guy de la Brosse, we hear plant joy as plants stretch their branches in the summer rain, whether we hook up a sensor, a sensor and a computer to an orchid on our desk, or whether we hear rain falling on vegetal drumskins, we're surely left listening for being and in the ecological pursuit of how we can possibly be with. Thank you. Um, before I start speaking about that old human thing called literature, let me just make a, a slight correction to the two laudatory presentations that I made of my responsibilities. I'm not an editor of Poetic, but of Bulletin Marcel Proust. <coughs> One of the most famous sounds in world literature can still be heard and triggered today, writes Michel Chion in his essay entitled Leçon published in 2010 and recently translated into English as Sound, an Ecological Treatise. This most famous sound is that of the rattling bell attached to the garden gate of Aunt Leonie's house, described at the beginning of Proust's In Search of Lost Time. The idea that it can be triggered again today may be wishful thinking by Chion, a composer of concrete music who's been mostly working with recorded sounds and is recognized as a theoretician of sound in film. A bell can indeed be found at the gate of La Maison de Tante Léonie in Ilie des Combré, but it's not the original one. At any rate, in quoting this well-known page, Chion does not seek simply to praise Proust's meticulous verbal accounting of a sonic impression, an achievement, he notes, almost always obtained by added touches and evocation, since, as it is well known, languages in general, and may I add, French in particular, have few words for describing and designating sounds themselves. Rather, in quoting this passage at the onset of a chapter entitled Sound and its Cause, Chion recognizes Proust's intuition of the two poles between which a given sound or its perception can be situated. Indeed, I quote, to the large and noisy rattle of the bell, which heralded and deafened with its ferruginous, interminable frozen sound any member of the household who set it off by entering without ringing, Proust juxtaposes the double, tinkling, timid, oval, gilded of the visitor's bell. In this, the theoretician of ecology recognizes the contrast of the cause itself to the sound. Rattle, Sion remarks, agglomerates sound and cause, tinkling, and encapsulates with a precise sonorous characterization the emancipation of sound from its origin. Several other sound significant contrasts can also be mentioned, and iron noise caught within its own shell versus a musical tinkling. Finally, the juxtaposition of a sound that is unintentional, triggered by pushing the gate of which it is a part, to an intentional one made by pulling a cord. Early on his essay, Chion quotes a little known poem by Victor Hugo from L'Art d'être grand-père the art of being a grandfather. Translated into English, it goes as follows. I hear some voices, glimmers through my eyelid. A bell is swinging in the church of St. Peter. Shouts of swimmers, closer, farther, no, over here, no, over there. The birds babble, Jeanne too. Georges calls to her, cock crows. A trowel scrapes the roof. Some horses pass in the alley creaking of a scythe that cuts the lawn, impacts, murmurs. The roofers walk on the house. Sounds of the port, whistling of stoke machines, military music that comes in gusts, hubbub on the quay, French voices, merci, bonjour, adieu. Doubtless it is late because 
here is my robin redbreast come to sing right next to me. Din of distant hammers in a forge, the water laps, a steamer is heard panting, a fly enters, immense breath of the sea. Let us note in passing that one could see in this poem an anticipation of stream of consciousness in French poetry. Sion's interest in the piece stems, of course, from the fact that apart from glimmers through my eyelid, it is practically just an enumeration of sonic waking impressions. This pattern, moreover, makes us hear sounds even in the three notations which are not semantically sonic. Horses passing in the alley, the roofers walk on the house, a fly enters. All this makes Hugo's poem a rarity. It is interesting to note that having singled out this poem from its uniform sound references, Sion is reluctant to consider it as an example of soundscape and questions the very pertinence of this concept, which presupposes that we can totalize what we hear. The portmanteau word, soundscape, was coined by Murray Schaffer in the 60s to refer to a sonic landscape implying, I quote, a totality organized in space with both foregrounds and backgrounds, with both details and ensembles that hold together. Elements of this structure can obviously be found in Hugo's poem. The ground, or keynote sound, in Schaffer's taxonomy would be the sound of the sea. Sion notes that aptly placed at the end of the poem, it suggests the tendency of sounds to absorb themselves in one another. Above all, it links the previous disparate noises and voices while at the same time unifying them. Even if we may object that this is not necessarily the case for all the sounds in the poem, this is a very interesting remark. It makes us, at least, contemplate the possibility that some of these sounds could be superimposed to one another, which is not the impression that we have in reading the poem in which everything is uncovered successively. Hugo's poem is a rarity, but it belongs to the poetics of distant sounds. Moreover, their cause is invisible. This is the listening situation that Pierre Schaeffer called acousmatic. In this case, the sounds are familiar and their cause easily identified by the listener. A more complex situation can be found in the jeans, les jeans, one of the most famous poems written by Victor Hugo. Although it belongs to Les Orientales, a collection of poems mostly inspired by the Orient, as was often the case in French art in these years of the Romantic movement, the monstrous creatures it evokes appear more connected to Nordic mythology than to Islam or to the Arabian Nights from which their name may be borrowed. In fact, we need not be so much concerned with the, by the cultural source of the poem if we recall that the menacing or destructive power of sound is a topos of many mythologies and science fiction, not to mention their alleged use against diplomats. What makes this poem a tour de force, at any rate, is its metric pattern. Its strophes grow from two to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 10 syllables and decrease according to the same pattern. Since the last quarter of the 19th century, a poetics of space, represented by Mallarmé's coup de or Apollinaire Caligram, coexists with the more traditional prosody of French poetry. Even in his analysis of Hugo's uh, waking impressions, as just reviewed, Chion does not dismiss a tension between the fact that they are successively recorded and the visual aspect of the poem, which, as it fits on a page, evokes for us something global and polyphonic. Interestingly enough, the jeans 
is often presented as an example of figurative verses. I have had it printed in one page to enhance its, its visual aspect. The English translation that I have juxtaposed to the French text is poor, but the poem may be untranslatable. This visual shape, however, is not iconic of an object, as is the case with most calligrams by Apollinaire. Rather, it is iconic, or more exactly, diagrammatic of a process, of an event, which is mainly felt as a sonic event. The birth of a faint sound approaching a city asleep, which, growing, is identified in Stove 5 as that of the Passover of the demons called legions, then reaches a screaming climax which terrifies the listener of the middle section and fades away syllable after syllable to almost nothing. Contrasting to the polyphonic soundscape one may or not see in the Waking Sounds poem, the visual pattern of the genes is a diagram of voice intensity, which with pitch, duration, and timbre is one of the four aspects of sound as it is notated in music. While the avant-garde poetic movement in the beginning of the 20th century would rely on the size of the letters to convey this parameter, Hugo's legend suggests it in a rare, if not unique, conjunction with metric pattern. This variation in sound intensity is of course made explicit in the very text of the poem. The sound grows loud, louder, etc. Opening in the mode of causal listening, in which one wonders what object, phenomenon, or creature caused the sound, it switches mainly to the mode of figurative listening, which has to do with mainly with what the sound represents. Having no time to make a close reading of the text, I'll turn to the performative mo mode. Before I start, uh, let me only add that Gabriel Fauré, uh, musical score of Legends, op opus 12 for choir and orchestra or piano, goes from double piano to double forte to double piano. Mur, ville et port, asile de mort, mer grise, où brise la brise, tout d'or. Dans la plaine naît un bruit, c'est la laine de la nuit. Elle brame comme une âme qu'une flamme toujours suit. La voix plus haute semble un grelot d'un nain qui saute. C'est le galop, il fuit, s'élance, puis en cadence sur un pied danse au bout d'un flot. La rumeur approche, l'écho la redit, c'est comme la cloche d'un couvent maudit, comme un bruit de foule qui tonne et qui roule et tantôt s'écroule et tantôt grandit. Dieu, la voix sépulcrale des djinns, quel bruit ils font Fuyons sous la spirale de l'escalier profond, déjà c'est un lampe et l'ombre de la rampe qui le long du mur rampe monte jusqu'au plafond. C'est les seins des djinns qui passent et tourbillonnent en sifflant. Les ivres que leur vol fracasse craquent comme un pain brûlant. Leurs troupeaux lourds et rapides, volant dans l'espace vide, semblent un nuage livide qui porte un éclair au flanc. Ils sont tout prêts, tenons fermée cette salle où nous les narguons. Quel bruit dehors, hideuses armées de vampires et de dragons. La poutre du toit décelée et poids, ainsi qu'une herbe bouillée. La vieille porte rouillée tremble à déraciner ses gonds. Cris de l'enfer, voix qui hurle et qui pleure. L'horrible essaim poussé par l'aquilon sans doute au ciel s'abat sur ma demeure, le mur fléchi sous le noir bataillon. La maison crie et chancelle, perché, on dirait que du sol arraché, ainsi qu'ils chassent une feuille séchée, le vent la roule avec leur tourbillon. Prophète, si ta main me sauve de ces uns purs démons des soirs, j'irai prosterner mon front chauve devant tes sacrés encensoirs. Fais que sur ces portes fidèles meurent leur souffle d'étincelle et qu'en vain longue de leurs ailes grincent et crient à ces vitres noires. Ils sont passés, leurs cohortes s'envolent et fuient, et leurs pieds cessent de battre ma porte de leurs coups multipliés. L'air est plein d'un bruit de chêne, et dans les forêts prochaines frissonnent sous les grands chênes, sous leur vol de feu plié. De leurs ailes lointaines, le battement décroît, si confus dans la plaine, si faible que l'on croit, où huir la sauterelle, crier d'une voix grêle, ou pétiller la grêle sur le plomb d'un vieux toit. D'étranges syllabes nous viennent encore, ainsi des arabes consonnent le corps, un chant sur la grève, par instants s'élève, et l'enfant qui rêve fait des rêves d'or. Les djinns funèbres, fils du trépas, 
dans les ténèbres, presse leur pas. Leur essaim gronde ainsi profonde, murmure une onde qu'on ne voit pas. Ce bruit vague qui s'endort, c'est la vague sur le bord, c'est la plainte presque éteinte d'une sainte pour un mort. On doute, la nuit, j'écoute, tout fuit, tout passe, l'espace efface le bruit. I want to second Philip's gesture of thanks. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and um, especially, I think this is my kind of panel, so I've really, really enjoyed um, being a participant in the, the talks that we've given so far this morning. I want to start by making a confession. I'm not here as an expert in French music. Um, my background is in music and the history of animal vocalization research. As a graduate student, I went to France in 2009 with very good musicological intentions that were derailed by ornithology. On my first night in Paris, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning to the sound of a European blackbird singing. And I was very surprised that I recognized this bird, which I'd never heard before, from Olivier Messiaen's transcriptions from the 1940s. Uh, he transcribed the bird's song in the beginning of his quartet for the end of time, and also in a Peruvian love story titled Harawi, which I think is being performed on Saturday. Um, and he also mentioned that he had transcribed the song um, in the 1940s from a bird singing between three and four o'clock in the morning. Um, can you go to the, okay. Can you play the um, two examples? So the first example, is a recording of one of these birds. They're all over Europe, but this is a recording from France. Um, so the, the second recording is uh, Messiaen's transcription. Um, this is the first one from uh, 1944 in the Quartet for the End of Time. So I really love this music, and I really love these birds. Um, but it turns out that these birds are pests. European bird guides describe Eurasian blackbirds as a shy woodland animal. But they're abundant in European cities. Um, and in fact, they're now a quasi-invasive species worldwide. I was thinking about Harawi, and apparently you can also find these birds in Peru. Um, ornithologists have shown that close relatives of the blackbird adapt to urban noise levels by singing at night in order to avoid competing with city noises, particularly noise from traffic. Um, as anyone knows who has lived in New York City, the blackbird's close cousin, the American robin, does this at around 3 o'clock in the morning here. Scholars like Karin Biesterveld have described your, uh, Europeans as debating and legislating the kinds of noises that keep robins and blackbirds up in the middle of the night. Um, and apparently they've legislated, uh, humans have legislated urban sounds since the late 19th century. So when Messiaen describes a blackbird uh, singing at three o'clock in the morning in 1944, I think it's plausible that the bird was trying to avoid urban noise. Recent scholarship in posthumanism would describe this midnight singing as a case of non-human agency. In recent years, a turn towards non-human agency and object-oriented ontology has helped scholars in the humanities express a shared desire to disrupt assumptions about human primacy and human knowledge making. While the turn towards non-human agency has been extremely productive um, and also related work in post-humanism, I want to think today about the ways that that turn connects to a lineage um, of categories of difference that shaped beliefs about nature in Messiaen's milieu in the middle of the 20th century and continue to inform the ways that we think about nature today. 
animals' voices have long had a special place in anthropology and other studies of culture. Works like Harawi built on older beliefs that natural sound, especially the voices and bodies of animals, served as a benchmark of natural difference against which other forms of difference could be compared. Um, we've already discussed this um, in Eliza's talk and also yesterday, uh, the notion that the boundary between language and music has been a contentious site for debates about the exceptional nature of human identity. French naturalists and music historians at the turn of the century debated music's animal origins, and they often used animals as a point of reference for comparison with tribal societies like the Incans. Um, there are many, many examples of this. I just happened to pick two for this slide. The um, image on the right is part of the table of contents of a kind of amazing book by this author, Francois de Fanny, who has a about 150 pages on birdsong and then progresses to a discussion of the origins of human language um, that uses a lot of transcriptions of European birdsongs. And then the quote is from a textbook that students um, at the Paris Conservatory might have used uh, that talks about the evolutionary origins of musical talent. Um, Ethnomusicologist Ana Maria Ochoa has pointed out the ways that these older traditions of alterity are so pervasive across European culture um, and Western culture that their constructions of difference continue to inform anthropology today. While historians and ethnographers have applied post-colonial critiques to these older comparisons between animal and exotic others, I want to go um, in a slightly different direction and consider the implications of the ways uh, that these were hierarchical comparisons in which animals' bodies and voices served as a fundamental measure of nature. Messian's hour-long song cycle, Harawi, which was composed in 1945 for voice and piano, drew upon many elements of this tradition. It's divided into 12 movements, uh, and the work contains appropriations of birdsong, simulated ape language, Peruvian folk melodies, rhythms from Indian treatises, and out-of-context syllables of the indigen indigenous Peruvian language Quechua. Messian based Harawi's exotic references on a 1925 treatise about the music of the Incas by ethnomusicologist Marguerite Beclard d'Arcourt. The title Harawi is drawn from her text, and it refers to a genre of Incan song that she associated in her book with laments and love songs. And some, um, some post-colonial writers have suggested that um, the association of this genre with lament might be a Western perspective on the um, sort of doomed nature of tribal societies in modern periods. Darkcourt had done fieldwork in the Andes, and she authored a series of studies with the help of her husband, Raul, of Native American music cultures. Her book on the Incas included examples of the Quechua language, transcriptions of Peruvian melodies, and descriptions of musical practice. She even composed her own version of a Harawi, a duet for flute and harp that Messian may have known from her 1923 collection, Chante Peruvian. Music critic Paul Griffiths has shown that this, the recurring theme of Harawi is actually borrowed from one of her transcriptions. Um, and this is a practice that's in keeping with Messian's uh, other approaches to his work. Um, uh, scholar Christopher Murray has done more recent studies that suggest that, um, sort of a harsh term, but they suggest thinking of Messian as a kind of plagiarist. Since we talked uh, in this panel session and also yesterday so much about the idea of um, language and syllables, it's not central to my talk, but I wanted to play a brief example from the fourth movement of Hurwawi, where he appropriates Quechua syllables um, with, and takes the meaning out of them. So he takes the syllables dun dun chill from uh, Darkhort's text um, and takes them completely out of context and uses them as a kind of rhythmic and timbral element. Um, that the soloist uses. So I'm just going to play that. <laughs> um, that's a short excerpt, but it goes on for several minutes. <laughs> 
Uh, also, if you're interested in the sources that Messian is using, um, this language, Quechua, also is the language of autoethnography that's um, more familiar to some historians from Mary Louise Pratt's study of Galman Palma's letter to the King of Spain in the early 1600s. Of the many idioms in Messian's song cycle, the songs of birds have a special place. They are the only reference that he draws from immediate observation. And avian musicality is constructed with a kind of specificity and attention that I don't think he really gives to things like Quechua or Incan culture. Birdsong is particularly prominent in the second movement where the poetic text references an imaginary green dove. The piano enacts the voice of the dove through an extended combination of transcriptions that hybridize a skylark and a blackbird, the bird we started with today. Um, and if you, can, if you can play the very top example, yes, that one. Um, this is Messian's transcription, which hybridizes these two birds. <laughs> So if you listen, I'll play the example of the blackbird again and uh, the skylark. And the, one of the things that maybe will help you tell the difference between the two is the skylark um, in real life and in Messian has a repeating note that's very prominent. So if you listen for that, that's probably what you might have noticed in the first example. So if you can play this, let's see the skylark first. It's the one next to the picture, the skylark, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 not that one. Sorry, the one that's down. No, that's the up, blackbird. Up, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> Thank you. And then if you go to the very bottom of the page, the blackbird again. And then uh, just so you can hear how he puts it all together, uh, the ex that one, um, you'll hear. <laughs> so what you hear in the um, finished version of the piece is he superimposes this melody that he borrowed from Darkhort's text as a kind of Incan melody in the voice. And he just superimposes that over these various birdsong transcriptions. So it would be very easy to launch a kind of um, mean post-colonial critique, uh, critiquing Messian's exoticisms in this work. And there's a sense in which I think that's a reasonable thing to do. But right now, I'm a little bit more interested in the way that Harawi intersects with a much larger moment at the end of World War II, in which notions of natural difference were being reconfigured to accommodate changing beliefs about race, culture, and animal identity. Under the auspices of the evolutionary synthesis, biologists and geneticists rejected comparisons between animal species and human races in the aftermath of World War II disparaging typological approaches that had been popular in comparative research during the 1920s. A group of 12 biologists and anthropologists affiliated with the synthesis met in Paris in 1950 to draft the first of four major statements on race sponsored by the United Nations. These authors included uh, geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky, um, American anthropologist Ashley Montague, and French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. The 1950 statement on race reflected a broader consensus among scientists and anthropologists that comparative methods could still be applied to culture or to species, but not between the two realms of culture and nature. This shift in the middle of the century towards a sharp divide between nature and culture brings me back to the more contemporary subject of non-human agency. 
Intellectuals, including Rosie Bredotti, Jane Bennett, and Elizabeth Povinelli, have used intersectional analyses in recent years to invite readers to rethink ethics on post-human terms. One of the central contributions of their work is the capacity to deconstruct the illusion that humanity is a species when in terms of post-humanist perspectives, it would be more aptly described as a privilege. But the work of thinking gender, race, species, and other types of difference at intersections doesn't fully account for the radically unequal status that separates those deemed fully human from those who are deemed natural resources. With Messian's Blackbird in mind, I want to conclude by asking how natures, and by extension, non-human plants and animals, have functioned as a foundational benchmark for measures of difference in the past two centuries, measures that are deeply grounded in hierarchical comparisons. When I ask this in relation to a work like Harawi, which contains problematic representations of gender, ethnicity, and species, I'm not making a comparative assessment about the relative worth of birds in relation to colonized peoples or genders. The purpose of thinking outside the human is not for me to weigh the relative value of Messian against that of a blackbird or the rights of indigenous peoples against the rights of animals. Instead, that comparative impulse, um, the, the desire to ask that question is part of a broader problem that I'm attempting to explore and articulate in this corner of French modernism. The thought that in the 20th and 21st centuries, nature has functioned as a benchmark precisely in order to justify the comparative evaluation of other forms of difference. I wanna conclude my talk by briefly returning to the unique status of birds in Harawi this time thinking of those birds as a mark of the intergenerational effects of living at the foundations of modern alterity. The blackbird and skylark were among Messian's first transcriptions because these species are particularly tolerant of changes in habitat that come with urbanization. And while Messian's later bird transcriptions reflect more diverse species, his most detailed bird songs remain those of resilient urban species. So that brings me to the question that I want to end with. How is our ability to hear non-human voices conditioned by traditions of evaluating the worth of non-human difference? And how do our traditions of hearing natural difference inform our desire to evaluate what it means to be human? Thanks. We're going to start with a discussion among the, the panelists, uh, and, but in view of the time, we'll move on quite sharply to a discussion with the uh, audience. Um, thank you all for really stimulating papers. Um, my question is for Rachel. I'm curious about um, one of the things that has struck me in my work on Marco Bruin Starlings is that he's working within the limits of the Occitan language and the notational system available to him. Yes. And I'm curious about whether Messiaen in his transcriptions of birdsong is actually, I mean, as you know, bird, some bird vocalizations go beyond the semitone and their division yes. of pitch. Um, is he stretching the limits of notation available to him in the case of birdsong um, so that's the first question. Um, and then my second question is that it strikes me that unless you, at least in the examples you played, unless you actually know what these birds sound like, it's not obvious that that's what he's attempting to do in Harawi. <laughs> Whereas when you have Quechuan <laughs> syllables that are, um, appear very suddenly, it's obvious that there's an exotic element in the piece. So I guess I'm asking about um, the ramifications of that difference in your analysis. Those are great questions. Uh, the first question, the short answer is we should talk. I, I've spent a lot of time looking at transcriptions of bird songs and it's a really fun topic. And Messian is probably one of the most sophisticated, uh, um, he has one of the most sophisticated approaches that used Western notation. He didn't use mnemonics, 
so he didn't use the kinds of sil nonsense syllables that you've talked about. Um, but other, other people did, and he worked closely with several French ornithologists in the 1950s to study bird songs as a semi-professional practice. So he probably knew the way that they did that. Um, I don't think that it was limited in France by the, the sort of sounds of the French language, but there was a tremendous difference between the, the broader perspective on what studying birdsong was for in France compared to particularly Britain, um, where a laboratory practice was emerging in the 1950s that really, really distinguished British ornithological practice and studies of birdsong from, from French studies. Um, your second question, I wish I was an expert on French music because I feel like this is a really good question. I am a passionate fan of Messiaen and my sense is that he did, he did actually with the previous work, um, the quartet for the end of time, he did name the birds with mm -hmm. the expectation audience members would know what they were. And he seems to have had a, a habit in later works of doing it, but it was suggested by um, one of his biographers that he didn't name them in Harawi because his students and some of his colleagues made fun of him for these bird songs in the 1940s. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not sure whether it was that he didn't, I, I suspect he wanted the audience to know what they were, but perhaps chose not to in this case because of prior experience with concert audiences. Excuse me. Are there, are there bird songs in the Turangalila? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> yeah, uh, quick question for you, because uh, I had no sense of humor. Um, to, so to take you at your word, pigeon poetics, uh, how much work does that word do for you? Because I, I was sort of thinking, of, I mean, I get the, I get it, right? But at the same time, I was like, that's actually kind of really interesting because it's 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 always describing a sort of non-native use of language. It's always described, which very frequently in the context of trade, right? And so I'm wondering, like, how much that theoretically does for you in the project? Because I think it could be incredibly rich, uh, and and you'll you'll tell us why, uh, in terms of you know thinking about what kind of human animal connection there is there, with the, all the long histories of colonial stuff that could sort of tie into that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's actually precisely that aspect of non-nativeness that interests me because it seems that, especially in the case of Marco Bruce Starling's song, the whole point of the exercise is arguably to make Occitan non-native to everybody who's listening to it. Um, not that it wasn't already non-native to begin with in the sense that it was a koine, but um, I think it's about hearing one's own language as something potentially meaningless and potentially um, non-native, and I will think more about that question. That's a great one. Thank you. Well, okay. I think uh, it sounds as though that the, the energy for discussion among the panelists is uh, is not is, is not is not high. Let's get, bring some more energy from the floor. <laughs> Uh, can we take, I think what we'll do is I'm going to take a leaf out of Frédéric's book and ask for three questions, three quick questions all at once and then we'll get the panellists to answer those and then we'll move on from there. So we have th at least three people with their hands up there. If you could just make, uh, uh, voice your question as c concisely as you can and then we'll hand back to the panellists. Uh, so this is on, yeah it is, you can hear me fine, right? Uh, actually I had, uh, a question along the same lines as, as Phillips, uh, because I had exactly the same impression. I thought, this is brilliant, actually, because uh, there are plenty of, of instances in which there are, uh, is a kind of negotiation between humans and animals. I mean, farmers communicate with their animals and vice versa, and hunters communicate with birds and vice versa. And actually, what I wanted to ask you, Eliza, is uh, instead of the, uh, the direction towards the, the meaningless chatter that is often ascribed to bird, bird song, the cra cra, or, or whatever, uh, what instances have you found, if any, of the opposite direction? Because there's, there's plenty of, of cases where people, we ascribe uh, even uh, silly meanings to, uh, to bird song, uh, or, or bird names, killdeer, for example. I mean, we take, we take human words that, and we apply them to that. To what extent do you find uh, theorists or natural historians or whatever writing about meaning 
recognizing, for example, their territorial songs, warning uh, calls, uh, mating songs, things like that. I mean, this is the connection also with the, the poetic tradition, associating the birds with competitive poets and with uh, love. Uh, so I wonder if you've run into any kinds of things in that, in that sense. Um, Are you going to answer? No. Yeah, I, it seems like you have a prejudice towards song, but what about calls? I'm thinking about uh, Jack London, actually, the call of the wild, which the wolf call it brings up, and in the sea wolf, where Wolf Larsen loses his sight at the end, and it's sound that allows him to trap and kill. So he, this kind of, um, you could say, anthropological idea <coughs> of human nature uh, being shrouded and overrun by our wolf nature, our uh, primate, you know, staying within that world, uh, or is our tendency to, in a sense, bow to the birds is because of the aesthetic uh, dimension of what we would call a song rather than a call, which is, uh, you know, th that's a distinction that I find interesting. Yeah. Um, First of all, thank you for all this, uh, those amazing talks and very inspiring uh, talks you, you, you did. Uh, I, I would like to involve the question of evolution, evolution of uh, species, uh, and that's the noises uh, species make. My, my question could be, uh, do the nightingale sing the same way in the Middle Age and today? Uh, but also about uh, plants. Uh, and then Thank you for reminding us uh, Guy de la Brosse is uh, such a wonderful, uh, but now very well, unknown <laughs> uh, author. Um, but also, well, I'm thinking um, about Goethe, uh, Goethe's metaphors, metamorphosis of plants, and all, of course Darwin, um, the question of adaptation, the role of the milieu. So uh, do you, would you think, could you say something about the sounds made by animals and plants connected with the, the laws of um, evolution, um, natural and cultural uh, evolution. Okay. Yeah. Well, should we address these questions in order or? <laughs> address the questions that, that you feel that you want to engage with, yes. Okay. Well, as I said, the first question okay. was addressed sure. to you. Perhaps you'd like sure. to start. Um, so the, the question was about, if I remember correctly, the tradition of ascribing meaning to song. Um, yeah. So I would say that um, the place I would look for that is in Markebrew's corpus. He's very, very attuned to the sounds of the natural world. Um, and I think he is highly aware that um, species are producing such things as warning calls. He mentions brood parasitism, obviously doesn't fall in this category, but he's, he's that attuned to um, ornithological phenomena. Um, I don't know, one thing that has really fascinated me as I work on this project is um, the fact that medieval French and Occitan poets, in contradistinction to other European traditions, um, are very hesitant to transcribe bird calls with nonsense syllables, um, which happens as we saw in Chaucer and elsewhere. And with very few exceptions, um, there seems to be maybe much more interest in engaging in bird calls in the process of making referential utterances, which I think is a um, has very si significant philosophical ramifications. Um, as I suggested, I think it's the claim that all language is potentially meaningless, that it's in the, the ear of the listener. Um, so that's what I would say in response to the first question. Um, in terms of the bias towards song rather than vocalization, um, I actually don't have the impression that this is a very meaningful distinction, at least in medieval theory. Um, strangely, the, um, the imitations I've found have much more to do uh, they have both to do with what we would call vocalization and song, um, and I'm not sure that uh, the distinction was as relevant then as it is today. I might, I have a kind of hybrid answer for questions two and three, <laughs> which um, to build off of what Eliza was saying about the distinction between call and song, 
Um, for me, in my own work, it's been very productive to locate questions like that at key moments in the 19th and 20th centuries when those kinds of questions have had different changing stakes. And at the end of the 19th century, um, Darwin's Descent of Man made claims about birdsong being one of the sources of inspiration for human aesthetics, and this was very, very controversial. And the debates that surrounded that claim for the next 30 years or so were related to the question of whether one would study uh, song, which was an example of musicality, or calls, which were considered and still are considered an example of language production. And uh, one of the things that's been really exciting for me to grapple with is that in the middle of the 20th century at this moment, when French and British ornithology really diverge for a brief period, Part of that divergence is because the changes I was talking about happening in the middle of the 20th century were also very strongly reflected in studies of animal vocalization. And studies of animal musicality um, were considered kind of inappropriate after, after this critique of cultural evolutionism. And part of the uh, effect of that was that the kinds of bird songs that were studied changed very dramatically. And this is only starting to shift like maybe now. So people went from studying in the early 1900s birds like the blackbird and studying songs that took 20 minutes and had a great deal of variation to studying birds in Britain. Um, William Thorpe did a very famous study of the chaffinch and his student Peter Marler did some studies of sparrow dialects in California that studied birds that had very, very short strophes. They were very repetitive and they were very easy to reproduce in laboratory contexts. Um, so the idea of musicality was basically taken out of the study of song and call in the 1950s and 60s. I have two things to add, if that's okay, I don't want to. Um, in response to your question about meaning that is non-semantic, one thing I forgot to say is that I don't think it's a coincidence that the vast majority of these experiments that I'm describing occur in the context of love song voiced by a male poet. Um, I think there's a consciousness that um, most avian vocalization occurs in the context of a male bird attempting to woo a female during spring, right? There's, which is, of course, the, the major topos of the opening of medieval lyric. Um, and in response to Francois's question, um, I think, so one thing I'm suggesting is that these poets are writing against a very rigid Latin grammatical, a tradition of Latin grammatical treatises in which voice can be classified only into four boxes. Um, and I think they're also writing against a Latin tradition called the voces animantium, which is um, transcriptions of animal noises that are rendered, or not just animal noises, actually, there are various forms of biophony, but that are rendered um, with a single Latin verb, which is, you know, saying like a cow lows, um, a bird tweets. Um, I think that they're, they're, these almost become humorous, actually. The notion that an animal vocalization could be rendered so simply is, becomes um, parodied almost. I'll, I'll just say a word about species. Um, the, uh, so I, I got into working on plants, thinking about plants. I was working on mines and stones and stuff, and every time I gave a talk, people asked me, well, don't plants come from the earth too? So I started thinking about that. And then I, I sort of started very, very simply to work on Ronsard's famous poem, Mignon à la voici la rose, and that opened up a whole can of worms uh, in terms of species. And uh, first of all, in a very sort of uh, positivistic way, I'm like, oh, I'm going to find out what kind of rose it was, um, which obviously you, you can't do. Uh, the, uh, and, and it was precisely uh, not just the fact that species as such didn't quite exist in early modern botany, but, uh, but also just the, the, the cultural accretion of certain ideas about roses, uh, mainly from the 19th century, uh, had come to make it impossible to, to read this poem or to know what kind of species of rose this might have been. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the visit Ronsard's house today where there's a lovely rose garden that they, the guide will tell you that it was Ronsard's original, uh, which it clearly is not, given that most <laughs> of the species were not even around at that point. And you can buy you know, rose-flavored bath salts and rose-flavored syrup and all this kind of stuff. And, and, it's in, and, and you, you think you're getting this sort of take-home uh, you know, sensorium that will help you enter into Ronsard, and it, it's precisely a species cultural fabrication of later times. And so, and so of late, what I've been trying to do in a, in a less positivistic vein, um, and largely 
thinking through some of this with, with Lucy Rigaret, who compares looking at who, who compares looking at plants and seeing a species of plant and trying to precisely not see the species of the plant in order to see le vivant of the plant, right? It's livingness. And so she opposes, you know, she talks, she has this whole thing about how Buddha looks at a plant and never says it's, it's a lotus. Uh, precisely to get away from that. So, so it's a really interesting point, actually, like the, the, this how the species actually kind of gets in the way of, of, of for me, I think, uh, seeing like le vivant of the plant. Um, what that has to do with sound <coughs> is another question. Yeah. Maybe it's another round of questions. Over there. Uh, you know, any group down here? Somebody up there. Uh, thank you. This is a fascinating panel, and I, I'm trying to decide which question to ask. Rachel already started answering my first question, so I'm going to move into the realm of language, the leftover that we were her hearing uh, about yesterday, and the kind of fascinating the sound and noise in all four of the. Uh, of the contributions, because in a sense, what we are also experiencing is, of course, a linguistic rendering of sounds that are perceived as non, uh, either non-human or non-linguistic in some sense. I mean, some of it is the old question of, you know, is birdsong at the beginning of language or of music or of both, etc. But there's also this play on on sounds that are not birds, that are other things, that are jinns, that are all these kind of things, and yet it becomes the pleasure of language to render sound. Now, this is, of course, a way right question, but it might sort of start bringing some of the issues together on the panel. And then another quick, uh, another question. Yeah. I have a question and a comment. Um, the first uh, comment is, I really enjoyed the entire panel. I think everything complemented each other and raised a lot of issues. Um, in uh, Eugène Nicole's talk, I, th I just wanted to point out that it's very, very interesting that both the poems that you mentioned, L'art d'être grand-père and Les Jeans, they start at night. The sounds emerge at night from a quiet environment, and then the sound is heard and, and um, thought about. Um, and maybe there's a connection with Rachel Mundy's paper where you mentioned that the birds now sing at night. Um, and maybe they also sing during the day, but we just don't hear them, mm -hmm. and we hear them at night. Um, so there's something about um, the lo-fi environment that makes the sounds emerge, and we listen differently. I don't know also in um, Philip's paper whether um, in thinking about plants there was something, that whether the um, um, thinkers that you discussed thought about plants at night versus during the day? I mean, did they make different sounds at night um, the way animals might? And the, the other, the question, um, we talked about lots of different birds. How about parrots? Um, because they represent a different kind of vocalization and uh, were represented in, in an interesting way from the Middle Ages to the present. Well, that's a bunch of questions, so it's a lot more than three, so let's <laughs> stick at that. Um, who would like to, to start with those? Uh, Eugène, perhaps you, you could make a start. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the difficulty for um, precising exactly what kind of, of sound, for example, in the genes. Uh, yes, yes, uh, obviously. Um, the poem is, is, is full of, of uh, approximation. Uh, it's sound, c'est comme, comme quelque chose comme that. Uh, the voice of the genes are not defined. And it's uh, only through uh, comparisons that uh, it can be approached. Uh, as far as night, uh, actually, in the, the, the first poem by Hugo, I think it's in the morning. Transitional, yeah. yeah. I don't know when Victor Hugo used to, to get up. I think it was an early. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, but that 
the city around is very much alive already. Sure. Um, so yeah, no plants at night. I mean, they so the moisture levels change a lot, and uh, I get very excited about this kind of thing. And and you can uh, there are recordings right of of the moisture levels in plants. You can actually literally hear like with a stethoscope the, the the water going up and the speed at which it goes up. And uh, you know there've been a bunch of sort of um, grand public books of late about the you know the, the life of forests and plants and, and stuff and who who pick up on that a lot to uh, underscore also you know um, trees sleep uh, but very lightly uh, so they get woken easily right so just like I, I have a, a Fitbit and it shows you like your different levels of sleep uh, you can do that for a plant too and you can um, and, you, and you can hear it um, but you just need the instruments but um, yeah and it, it's cool, right? Because it goes right back to the, the, the most famous poem about roses, the Ozonius poem, which is all about, you know, the carpe diem motif, literally carpe diem, right? Seize the day, not the night. It's all about the, the sort of the rhythm. And that's always read, and it's this nature culture thing, it's always read as a, you know, a, a, a metaphor, a lesson you can take away. Uh, it's not. It's, it's literally a plot. You know, and it's it's a plant that we can be with, and we can appreciate those rhythms and, and, and experience it at the same time. But um, so so I so I th think it's interesting that some of the sort of actual plant sound that we can now access undoes some of the cultural work that that certain poems um, mm. do. So can we get um, more of an answer, perhaps, to Anna Grade's question? I mean, I thought that I uh, I would like yes. to just point out that one of the, the the contributions that this panel has made has been really to focus on or at least to draw attention to sounds that are made that, that are non-vocal mm. alongside sounds that are vocal. Um, and Anna Great's point is in the end of that they all become vocal, uh, which in a way is what Rachel said at the end, uh, you know, the great chain of being, being just chains everything up again, uh, or at least there's a risk that that's what's going to happen. Um, so it'd be great to have some responses to that, I think, very helpful question. I don't have a response because I, you know, <laughs> but I wanted to also um, ask that my uh, co-panelists, uh, maybe also maybe we can meditate on this word pleasure that Anna Gret used because in some ways I feel like that's a very powerful point of entry to this question about language is like to think about what the stakes are um, in taking pleasure and identifying the distinction between um, a sense of sound that is linguistic and a sense of sound that is noise. Mm -hmm. I think uh, then we have to to go beyond the sound. Uh, a sound is not linguistic, but if you define a language uh, strict, strictly speaking, you have to double to have the double articulation: semantic and syntactic. And actually, that was a question I was about to ask to, to you all. Uh, can, can we speak of language in the case of birds or plants? Mm. Uh, le langage des fleurs et des choses muettes. Mm. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire, le langage des choses muettes? So, so there's, um, I mean, I, um, I'm not sure how much in, in the, the things that I spoke about, how much, how much vocalizational language there was, but tell me. Uh, but, the, but, but one thing but that I could have done and, and I think that, in a sense, that uh, pl plants, depending again on how we define language, do have a language. There's the, I forget who coined the term recently, but the wood wide web uh, about the way in which plants talk to each other through root systems, right? <laughs> and so you can, it's a thing. And so a plant that's aware of a threat will communicate that threat through the root system to another plant that's not that far away, and the second plant will react differently to it, right? It'll be, it'll like brace itself, it'll like dig its roots in and, 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 and be ready for it. So if, a co if, 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 a co if, if that is a, I mean, uh, is that a language? Um, depends how you define it, but. I wasn't so much interested in language 
as, uh, as if, if you want, on the, on the level of meaning, but really in the pleasure of sound and in the playing with sound. And in a sense, I mean, if I were responding directly to you, I would say, but it is your own pleasure mm. that we were par uh, participating in just now in extracting these sounds of something that we most of us will think of inanimate objects or objects that are animate but are uh, mute. So even there, but uh, it's also this sheer pleasure that we were witnessing in your PowerPoint of trying to sort of create through currents sound that we would associate uh, you know, with, with all kinds of other things that become the sounds of plans mm -hmm. uh, um, in an almost music concrete sense of the, of the thing. And I was then sort of sitting there and thinking, yes, but I mean, uh, picking up on Rachel's point about music and Messier, who is using... Uh, all kinds of ways to represent the birds. But, you know, I'm, I'm someone who works on mostly 19th and early 20th century music, so you think about every single composer who is going to have his silly little brook and uh, all kinds of other ways of, 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 of sonically representing something that we are experiencing, maybe a sound or that might be the rustling of leaves. There's a very famous moment in Wagner's Tristan where you have the, the, the brook and the leaves, etc., that sort of become then transformed into all kinds of other things of the night. I mean, so, so it is not something that is completely divorced, mm -hmm. at least from Western musical culture, of what we are currently talking about, but that takes us at a slightly different point than the one that I was trying to make uh, in relation uh, to, to Francois's paper earlier yesterday about these leftovers in voice. So I moved from voice to music, but I also wanted to sort of bring these levels, these various levels of sonic, from the noise to the silence, to the music, to the language, to the utterance, etc., into this panel that you were engaging with. Sorry, that was longer than I wanted. Um, it's, this is making me think of uh, when I've worked with scholars in animal studies, one of the things that I find really compelling about that arena is there's a kind of inner tension between a sort of a application of post-colonial and critical identity studies critique to representations of the animal and the fact that we're all in it because we love talking about animals in the stuffed animal toy sense. And Yuna Chaudhary, uh, who is a scholar here at NYU, uh, used the phrase, the gift of radical otherness to describe the latter experience of pleasure. And I found that very compelling because it, it, it articulates the otherness that is the source of pleasure that also needs to simultaneously be a source of critique. Okay. Um, actually, I had contemplated uh, talking about the Urlauten Sonata. And that's, that's a good example of just playing with sounds. And it's, it's a masterpiece, of course, of what's called poésie sonore. B, b, v, b, v, b, etc. And uh, another thing very interesting is that the, uh, in the Urlauten Sonata, the, um, the person becomes a bird. I was just going to say, I think it's no coincidence that um, much of the experimentation that's been described today happens in the context of poetry or music, um, or vocal music, um, because I think there's an awareness, certainly um, Mladen Dolor has written about how in vocal music um, one is aware, A, of the voice as a vehicle, but also that the voice becomes incomprehensible as a very result, as the result of the medium. Um, and I think medieval poets were aware of that as well, that all poetry is fundamentally sound patterning, um, and there is a constant tension between um, modes of listening to it. Take another round of questions now, if there are, if there are any other questions. Judy, one, anyone else? Uh, th this is... This is uh, almost blasphemous, I think. It's a question for Philip. And I say blasphemous because I've been wondering if you've been thinking about smell. <laughs> Since you're talking about plants and blasphemous, we're in another, we're in an entirely different realm, perhaps, of the senses. But smell is even more complicated in terms of finding a vocabulary for it, isn't it? And I think thinking about this difficulty of expressing sound, right, is... I walk on the High Line almost every morning. I don't know if anybody lives in New, 
visiting New York, you should try this. The smell is exquisite from all the plants that are there. And uh, is, are you just, are you dealing with that or are you just putting it somewhere for the moment? Uh, I'm just putting it somewhere for the moment. <laughs> But you're right, right? It's a similar problem. It takes me back to an event that Benoit organized uh, two, three years ago, I forget, at the Maison Francaise, uh, about, about the language you used to talk about perfume, right? With two very different speakers whose names I don't remember. One who's a New York Times perfume critic and the other was a, the, the, uh, the house historian for, I forget which, Maison. Dior. Uh, Dior. And, uh, and, and the, the, the kind of language and the kind of, uh, you know, I, one could almost say that, you know, the house historian brought the sort of culture side, right, of a certain story that he wanted to, to have these smells tell, and that the New York Times critic sort of brought the, let's say, nature side. They both use metaphors pretty much constantly, but very different ones, right? Like one, uh, which I won't repeat here, but... <laughs> they, uh, but they were they they, they they approached the same smells with very very different metaphors, and it's true that um, that it's a it's a it's a I mean it's a lot easier to talk about smell in or is it maybe it's not I mean it's a lot easier to talk about it's a lot easier to we all smell easily. We smell. Well, the, but do plants smell? Do plant well of course yeah I mean and that gets written about a lot right it's a lot easier to to name to distinguish uh, I guess it goes back to that maybe it goes back to even like in pre pre Linnaean times the emphasis on categories right and classifying and identifying mm -hmm. and being able to say well this is that and that's that and that's that and to the point that the uh, I'm working a bit on another botanist called Carolus Clusius at the moment whose whose uh, correspondence is available he's written thousands of letters and you can follow how his uh, his, his own sort of herbals like evolve and he's, he's correcting them and he's sent writing to the printer saying, well, actually, I've been able to cultivate this plant now. I was wrong. Uh, it really smells like this. Uh, it's a lot harder to do that for sound in plants. So um, it's not an answer. Yeah, I'm no, putting it to one side. But, but no, I mean, yeah. Jen? Um, thank you uh, very much for this panel. Um, so I, I think the panel was doing a very good job at challenging the human non-human opposition. Um, and but I had more question about because we talk about bird sounds, uh, plant sounds. So we are still thinking of ontological categories uh, of uh, animals, plants, and humans, and. I was thinking about the example of the woodpecker, which kind of bring mm -hmm. <laughs> the birds and the plants together. Mm -hmm. Is the sound produced by the woodpecker or by the plant? And I was thinking, or the question mm -hmm. of the thinking more sounds as a um, material assemblage. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to hear you about this. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, and and I, you know, the, the what some of the 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 other recordings that the the from from the same person who from the person who, from whom I played sounds did other recordings, uh, many of which involved animals, right? And often uh, several animals at the same time, and often enemy animals. So you'd have a beetle and a woodpecker, and uh, as you know, woodpeckers eat beetles, so it was a very precarious situation. But yeah, no, I mean, I think that. Um, uh, where am I going? I think that, uh, yeah, it's precisely that, and you raise a really good point of, of and it maybe goes back to yesterday's, uh, what, what Francois was saying about the, the not seeing or the, the, the acousmatic turn, the, the in not trying to identify a source, but identifying a series of agents that create that source. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's a really good way to put it. I both want to respond to this idea of material assemblages, but also share a woodpecker factoid, <laughs> um, because I've read way too many 20th century sources on birdsong. A very widely recognized American ethologist named Wallace Craig um, praised woodpeckers for being particularly good examples of artistry. 
because in his neighborhood they had quit using trees and were using metal chimneys because he, he believes they liked the sound better. Oh. <laughs> and, and, so perhaps it's not about the plants, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, the woodpeckers I hear really, it's the trees that they're with. Um, I'm, I must say for myself, I'm really still struggling and thinking through this uh, ideas like assemblages as a way to think about this. And one of the reasons that I struggle with it is because it seems to me that the the inheritance that we bring to the table when we think about things like animal sound and language or sound and sense and animal vitality, um, and then try to deconstruct that hierarchy by thinking about matter in broader terms, is that the, the hierarchy is also the means by which we've developed a language of ethics. And so when you think about um, the woodpecker and the chimney, I'll take the tree out of the equation. <laughs> so if you think about the woodpecker and a chimney, uh, whether it's the correct approach or not, the w language that we have for thinking about things like rights and dignity applies differently to the woodpecker than it does to the chimney. And so because of that, and because I haven't yet sorted that out in my own mind, um, and I don't believe that new materialism has sorted it out either. Uh, because of that, I'm hesitant to sort of go in the direction of material assemblages that is very productive for some scholars. I just haven't quite felt ready to do it because of that. Yeah, I think the, um, the term material assemblage is very useful, and I wish I had used it. Um, especially in the sense that in the case of the Starling song, it's um, the whole thing ultimately becomes just a collection of sounds. It's not just Marker Brew imitating a Starling, it's Marker Brew imitating a Starling, imitating a woman. Um, so the whole question of who's the agent behind the noise becomes unresolvable and it just becomes sheer sound. Um, so thank you for that. Have you ever, any of you, heard a conversation uh, which reaches a, a, some sort of conclusion between animals, between birds? Have you followed? No. In, in what sense uh, concludes or? I mean, the way people talk about why they're going to a certain store, or uh -huh. do, do you ever hear that sort of thing? So it's, it's more a sense that they express themselves than that they question. Uh, I mean, um, the... I mean, thinking of plants talking to each other about, you know, w warning each other, you know, it's... A warning, I you know, guess that's it. Sort of, you know, it's similar to, you know, mind out, there's a car coming. Mm -hmm. uh, or, um, and also, like, plants are very sensitive to, I'm not a plant specialist, but by a long shot, but, you know, they're, they're very aware of the, their parent growing next to them, and they do sort of send messages back and forth, and... Um, which which one can sonify, I suppose, in various ways. Um, so not wanting to push in the direction of saying p plants are like humans, but I think so. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like this 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 is a wonderful. Qu I mean, I love this kind of question, or I wouldn't be doing the work I'm doing. <laughs> but it's also very hard to answer because mm. you have to assume that you know what's going on. Um, and it seems like the studies I've read that are more recent since the last 15 years or so of animal vocalization, uh, they seem, it seems like they're easiest to fit into the scientific method if they deal with rather harsh contexts like alarm or mm -hmm. violence. And so there is a really wonderful study um, by a scholar whose name I can spell but not say because it's a very like Eastern European name. Um, he's a ethologist in Arizona and he did a study of uh, prairie dog vocalizations and he studied their alarm calls. And they're extraordinarily specific. Um, they can articulate, this, his group of graduate students has been able to distinguish between sounds that signify something like 
a thin woman wearing a red shirt going by versus a different call for a, a man wearing a red shirt going by. Um, so that kind of work has been done. And I don't know that it's really a conversation, but I think that has more to do with what kinds of questions can be asked in an experimental context. Do you ever see a friendship developing, for instance, between birds or... I, I'm a good example because I can barely hear any of you. And... Uh, so I've had to sort of guess what you're saying. Yes, uh, Elizabeth Kirby wanted to ask a question. Oh, yeah, um, sort of um, developing on Jeanne's question about ontological categories. Um, so I notice almost all of the ontological categories that come to my mind are represented in this panel, except I'm thinking about um, in Sarah's keynote, air. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering, uh, how does air sort of in plant sound or bird sound song, um, does air appropriate song, uh, sound in any way? Does, does sound exist in air in the way it exists as, so like if we could say like air sound in, as well as plant sound and bird sound and um, the gin sound. Um, so I have not myself worked on this, but if I remember incorrectly, Sarah has. Can I invite you to? <laughs> I also wanted to ask you um, about your keynote yesterday. It sounded like um, if the main medieval distinction is between sonus and vox, you're actually arguing that these texts are theorizing something that transcends those two categories um, and aggregates them somehow, and that somehow relies on air um, as the kind of substrate so I was going to ask you the same question about um, air, and also whether it's a coincidence that that, bec that that pushback against this theory, if I'm correct, happens in the um, in the medium of poetry, which is a medium that depends on air. Well, I didn't want to take over from the panel, actually, at this stage. It would be nice if anybody else wanted to answer that Elizabeth question before I answer Eliza's. No, I sure. See okay. Well, yeah, very ahead. briefly. I mean, the the that, that's a little bit where I was gesturing with the the idea of the pneuma that, that Sarah talked about, in which in in you know Kochia's book, where he's drawing on a wide variety of sources, you know, says that also applies to plants, um, and it, it does. I mean, you can there there are certain sound artists who've worked with the breathing of plants, right? And the um, I've actually been working with a. Uh, I was hoping to show it today, but it didn't didn't kind of quite happen. But I've been working with a visual artist and sound artist in ca in uh, in California, uh, 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 filming a, an orchid, and filming an orchid listening to sound in different sound environments, and the 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 extent to which the the orchid shakes uh, in different sound environments and stuff. But um, yeah, it's not finished. But but yeah, th I think the pneuma for me would be the way to go. But let's. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I mean, I, th I think actually the, the speakers did uh, mention air. Philip talked about the way that plants form part of the circulation of mm -hmm. the air. And that the, the, the mar a marvelous line at the end of one of La Fontaine's fables, which is about the question of whether animals can speak or not, and the very last line is, <gasps> Mais la plante, la plante respire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I... I uh, I, I think that in, in response to what you were saying, uh, Eliza, uh, the antique discussions of voice um, inter interweave it and cross-cut it with the discussion of sound. As, I mean, vo voice is a certain kind of sound. All sound is produced by an interruption of by a, by a beating of the air. In the case of the voice, that beating of the air happens in the vocal apparatus. Um, uh, so the, the two languages, the, the discourse of sound and the discourse of voice, intersect in a certain a, 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 a accident of physiology, um, which, of course, is not the physiology of the stars. Um, and so that it, to talk of that as voice is to, is to use the, the term voice in a very extended, in a very extended way. Um, and, and yes, I mean, and, uh, I suppose then the response to the idea of, of the assemblage 
I think what I, I, I think that the one of the points I was trying to make that might be, uh, that might help to link the different kinds of entities that were talked about on this panel is that I, 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 I would put forward the idea that there isn't an expression without an, without an, 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 an initial impression, mm -hmm. which is the result of a prior expression, and so forth. And so that uh, the, to the idea that the sound originates somehow with an individual um, is not as helpful as thinking of it as circulating uh, somehow and circulating by the same kind of medium as the as the air circulates, but I don't want to preempt the discussion. Uh, however, actually, I noticed that it is <laughs> uh, just after half past 12. So m maybe maybe we should, in fact, just draw this to a close now and thank, thank our four speakers so very warmly for a wonderful, wonderful discussion.